okay. I have to click. Okay, so uh, I've put things, some definitions from last time. So we had this notion of cellular map. Um, and the point was it has this, this kind of triangular shape here. So the, the first coordinate of the map only depends on the, the first variable, the second coordinate only depends on the first two and so on. When we fix the first i minus one variables, the function is strictly increasing in the last one. And then cellular, cellular parameterization, cellular R parameterization is a parameterization of a set. So you cover the set with images of maps. Um, and in a cellular R parameterization, we want those maps to be cellular and their derivatives up to order R to be bounded. Um, so that's this. So a cellular R parameterization, oh, they should also be definable. Uh, so it's a finite set, five definable CR cellular maps with depend on the derivatives. Um, and then they cover the, their images cover the set. And then if you have a function on that set, um, a cellular R parameterization of the function is a cellular R parameterization of the domain. So that in addition, when you read the function through those charts, its derivatives exist and are bounded by one. Um, and then the statement is that these things exist. So, ah, uh, something went wrong with the statement. <laughs> I thought I'd been clever and not prepared. Okay, give me a moment. Oh, no. Okay, here's the statement. <laughs> so the statement says the first part, it's it's like cell decomposition, it has two parts, one for sets, one for functions. First part says that we can find cellular R parameterizations of sets. Second part says that we can find cellular R parameterization of functions. Um, and at the end of last time, we had this this thing where we showed if you have two cellular parameterizations, or well, sorry, you have a cellular parameterization and another one that parameterizes the domain of the first one, then when you can compose them, you can do this trick with linear substitution to get a, another cellular R parameterization. Okay, so now we're ready to start the proof. So the proof will be by induction on the ends. That's why I've separated them out here. But first of all, we'll just have a lemma that says in the second one, it's enough to prove this when the the map just goes to i rather than i to the n. Um, ah, and I'm also going to now from now on. Uh, we assume um, is Aleph zero saturated, um, and it's enough to prove it under that assumption because then it goes down to the, the other models. Um, Okay, so the lemma um, So what this says is if I know this statement here with n is one, then I know it in general. So I have n and r uh, and suppose that every f from x to i, uh, definable on a definable x in i to the n. Um, let's do this. Definable x uh, prime of dimension n. Um, 
has a cellular optimization. Then the same is true for every map on every definable set uh, of dimension n. Then for every definable G, um, and M, where dim X is N, uh, you know, then every definable G where dim X is N has a cellular power parameterization. Okay, so to prove that, you, you just work your way through the coordinates. So, proof, fix G to be G1 up to GM, and then by the assumption I can find a cellular R parameterization, the first coordinate function. So let phi1 be a cellular R parameterization of g1 um, then it's enough to find a cellular uh, parameterization of um, g of phi for phi in phi one, using the trick we did last time. Um, so what does this mean? Well, this means we can assume, so this one, its first coordinate is controlled, right? So this means, so we, by replacing G with this thing, we can assume G one has bounded derivatives. But, um, And then you apply it to the next one. So then you apply the assumption. Then get a cellular R parameterization phi two of G two. Um, if so, what happens then? If I if I got phi in phi two, then G two of phi is okay, but I have to, to worry about G one of phi, but. G1 of phi, if you compute, it's going to be less than or equal to some constant, depending on n and r. Um, and then that's nothing to worry about. <laughs> so what do you do? Well, okay, so you can keep going this way. So you reparameterize the coordinates one at a time, and you'll get um, and you get to, well, you get to assume that GI is less than some constant, depending on N and R in derivatives, rather. Um, and then you do this linear substitution trick to, to make this constant into a one. Uh, so then you use linear substitution. to get well, a bound of one. Okay, so that tells us that when we're handling, when we come to prove two one here, two n rather, we can um, assume we have just a function rather than a map. Uh, so now we'll start the proof of, ah, well, so we're gonna do this by induction, but, for n equals one, this one is okay. So I have to prove this one for n equals one, right? Because if I have a definable subset of i, it clearly has a cellular r parameterization. Um, so we now start proof of 
uh, two, one, so the function version. Um, so, so a lemma, so this I think is due to Gromov. Um, so suppose R is at least two, and F um, is definable. Uh, CR minus one, and its derivatives up to order R minus one are less than or equal to one. So it's, we've got the, what we've got what we want up to order R minus one, and R is at least two. Then F has a cellular R parametrization. So the trick here is to substitute X for Z. So we've got C. That so the proof. Okay, so first, by by applying smooth monotonicity, we can assume that our function is is um, um, r times differentiable, uh, and we can assume it's um, uh, r derivative is strictly monotonic. Um, so by smooth. What do I want? It's R minus one derivative. Uh, by smooth monotonicity. Oh no, we can um well we can split into intervals. On which uh, F is C R. Uh, and on which its R derivative is uh, strictly uh, monotonic. And we can also assume non-zero. So on an interval where its R derivative is constant, it's okay, we don't have to do anything. Um, uh, Non-vanishing. Um, and then without a lot of generality, I can assume that each one of these intervals is I. So let's take F for strictly decreasing. On I and M positive. Okay, then I can apply the mean value to M. So that's true for definable functions of minimal structures. Uh, so then for X in I, uh, there is a, a psi X between zero and X such that, so what do I get? I get F R minus one of X minus F R minus one of zero divided by X. That's the value of the R derivative of psi. Um, that's at least uh, F R of X. And, and this, these are both bounded. So this is less than or equal to some constant depending on R divided by X. Okay, so now I'm gonna take G to be f of x squared. So this is what's going to have um, uh, bounded derivatives up to order r. So that's what we have to check. Well, when I go up to r minus one, it's okay. So the only issue is at order r. And um, when we compute gr, What do we get? Uh, well, we get some bounded terms, which would involve um, the derivatives of f of order less than r. So we get g r of x equals some sum 
of some bounded terms plus the one that we have to worry about is the one where we differentiate f r times so what does that look like it's plus and constant um then i differentiate f r times and then i get an x to the r now this we can handle because of this computation here so by the above the r derivative of x squared times x to the r uh, if I put x squared in here and I get it's less than some constant times x to the r minus two and r was assumed to be at least two so this is bounded Uh, oh, it's at least two. Um, so this G has the property we want almost. It's less than or equal to some constant. And then we use linear substitution again to make that one. So that proves the lemma, that proves our parameterization under this assumption um, that R is at least two. So then you have to handle the first derivative and then you'll be okay inductively. And the first derivative roughly you handle by taking the inverse if you need to. So let's do that. Uh, uh, so suppose F, from I to I is, um, is a definable uh, function. I have some natural number R. Um, then this says that there is a, there's an R parameterization of the graph of F. Um, so what does that, so, but it might not be cellular. So then there is, so well, then there exists definable CR functions, uh, phi one up to phi K. So now these go to I squared. And um, whose images cover the graph. And um, such that the uh, derivatives are all bounded. Uh, and each coordinate of each uh, phi i is either strictly monotonic or constant. Okay. Well, how can we prove this? So, well, I've got my function here. Uh, so um, I can apply smooth monotonicity to get it. That it's at least it's C1, except at finitely many points. So by smooth monotonicity. Uh, we can assume f is c1 on i. Um, and then it's either constant as well or strictly monotonic. And we can assume its derivative is either less than one on i or between minus one and zero or bigger than zero, uh, between zero and one or bigger than one. Um, so we can assume f is c1 on i and uh, F is either constant on I uh, or strictly monotonic. Um, 
and such that f prime is less than one to one. Uh, on i. So one of these holds all of, all of i. Um, and then we can actually suppose this one holds by um, taking our interval backwards um, or uh, swapping f with its inverse. So um, we can then assume um, Uh, this holds um, by uh, using F inverse if necessary, and perhaps reversing the orientation of I. So F inverse in place of F. Okay, so then I've got a, a function whose first derivative is bounded by one. Um, and then I can apply uh, this with R equals one, because my function is now C1 and I've got first derivative bounded by one. But then I can apply r minus one times inductively. So then we apply the previous lemma r minus one times uh, to get a parameterization. big phi of i, right, the first one gives us a parameterization of the function, so that's the parameterization of the interval, um, such that when I read the derivatives of the function through the charts, they're all bounded. Um, and then we want a parameterization of the graph, so we then take uh, phi and then f of phi in the second coordinate. Um, has our parameterization. Of the graph. And then we can use that lemma that we've just done. So we've now parameterized the graph. And what we want is to prove the cellular parameterization. So um, so we can now prove two one. So by our lemma at the start, it's enough to do this for a function from i to i. We don't have to worry about a function from i to i to the n. Um, so it suffices to do this for a definable function f from i to i. Um, well, we apply the previous lemma to get a um, parameterization Big phi of the graph. Um, and then I want to just take the first coordinates of all of those. So those are all maps from, to i squared. So I could just take the first coordinate, but then some of those might be decreasing. And if they're decreasing, 
I compose both of them with the second with um, one minus x. So um, if phi and phi uh, has strictly decreasing first coordinate, um, we compose with. one minus x um, and then that makes it increasing uh, and then this ensures that when I just take the first coordinates uh, perhaps it's easier to write phi equal phi one phi two in big phi so this ensures that the collection of first coordinates is a cellular R parameterization of I. Um, and then we have to check that it's, it handles composition with F. And since, so, well, we know that, uh, it's, it's second coordinate has derivatives bounded by one, but this big phi here is a parameterization of the graph. So this is equal to um, f of phi one. Um, so that means that we do have a cellular R parameterization of f. Okay, so that does the base case. And then, um, so inductively, I'm going to assume that uh, 1m and 2m hold for um, uh, m less than or equal to n. Um, And then we have to prove, under that assumption, we have to prove one in plus one. Uh, and then we have to do the other case where we assume like one M for M less than or equal to N and two M for M less than N and have to prove two N. That case is much more difficult. This one's easy. Uh, so what do we have to do? Well, we have a set X in I to the M plus one that we want to parameterize. Um, so by cell decomposition, we can suppose it's a cell. Um, so then it's either a graph of a function, the space between two functions. So if, if it's a graph, um, Uh, we have a continuous definable function on some x prime in i to the n. Um, so then I can apply 2n to this function. Um, so if that we apply to n to f to get a cellular our parameterization of f. Um, so what do I want? I want a cellular R parameterization of x. Well, take one of the the parameterizing maps in this phi. What? So then, what? What is it? So phi maps some uh, basic cell c prime in i to the n to i to the n. Uh, and I want my 
parameterizing maps to be on a basic cell in i to the n plus one. Um, and then we just put t prime t to be c prime times zero um, and define psi from c to uh, i to the n plus one by sending uh, x zero to um, phi of x. So that's an element of uh, i to the n. And then in the second one that we put f of phi of x. Um, and then the phi is a cellular R parameterization of f. So this is going to be a bounded derivative. So since this is less than or equal to one, um, we can take like we take all of the size corresponding to the phi's in phi, and we get a cellular R parameterization of x. And then there's the other case where x is the space between two functions. That's quite similar. Okay, so otherwise, then if, if it's not a graph, it's a space between two graphs. Um, so now we apply 2n to the map uh, fg. So this is slightly confusing notation. This is like the space between these two functions. This is the map that has first coordinate f and second coordinate g. Um, so we get some cellular r parameterization phi of fg and and i take one of those one of the maps in there so that's defined on a basic cell like before so c prime contained in i to the n a basic cell and so i'll put c to be c prime times i now and define psi from c to i to the n plus one. So x prime x n plus one goes to uh, phi of x prime. So that's the first n coordinates. And then in the second coordinate, I take g of phi x prime times x n plus one plus one minus x n plus one times uh, f of phi of x prime. And then, uh, so the derivative of this is bounded, derivative of this is bounded. Um, so then since uh, these two are less than or equal to one, the derivative of this is going to be bounded by constant. Uh, C, and we can use linear substitution. To finish. Okay, so that's the proof of uh, one in the inductive case, like the, the set version. So now we want to do the function version. So, um, So what do we do? What do we assume? So proof. And then now we assume for two. Uh, so we now 
assume um, 1m uh, for m less than or equal to n and 2m for n less than n and show that to n holds. Um, so first there's going to be a sequence of reductions to this. Um, but before that, there's an exercise. Um, so we have 2n minus 1 in particular here. Um, so as an exercise, using saturation, and definable choice, show that 2n minus 1 uh, implies the following uniform version of 2n minus 1. So suppose instead of a, a single map from i to the n minus 1 to i I have um, a family um, uh, then then I can partition this interval here so the parameter space partition of I into definable sets. Um, and then such that for each each J, there's a parameterizing, um, there's a uniform parameterization of F uh, when the parameters are in 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 that IJ. Mm. That's what we mean, such that for each J from one up to K. Uh, there exists phi j set of definable maps uh, phi from i j times c to i n minus one, where c is a basic cell in i to the n minus one, depending on phi, um, such that for A in IJ, uh, such that if A is in IJ, then when I plug in uh, A into the first coordinate of these, what I get parameterizes FA. Um, so, So I take all of the maps in phi j, I plug a into the first coordinate. So that gives me a bunch of um, uh, maps defined on this basic cell. And what we ask is that those uh, are a cellular R parameterization of f with a plugged into the first coordinate. So if that then is a cellular R parameterization of F A dot. Okay, so because we're assuming two n minus one, and two n minus one implies this, we can use this. Okay. Um, so now we have a we have to prove two n. So we have a function f from x to i. Uh, so now suppose. Um, F maps I, oh, sorry. Suppose F maps X to I. So I can suppose that the codomain is, is I, not I to the N, by the lemma we proved at the beginning. Um, so X contained in I to the N definable. Um, we want to find the cellular R parameterization of that.
So the first reduction is just to show that we can take X to be all of I to the N. Um, so how can I do that? Well, I'm assuming that I can, uh, I can reparameterize sets in I to the N. So I can reparameter and I can parameterize X, right? Uh, so by applying one N to X, and, and working with each chart separately, we can assume that X is a basic set. Right, so I consider one of my phi's in this parameterization. I look at f of phi, that has the main a basic cell. Now, if that basic cell has any zero coordinates, then I can use the inductive assumption. Um, if this has any uh, zero coordinates, we can use two, oops, sorry, big two, um, for M less than N to finish. So I can assume that it's a basic cell without any zero coordinates, and that means it's I to the N. So we can assume X is I to the N. Oh, so we can assume F maps I to the N to I. So that's first reduction. So the next reduction is going to be, we can assume F is CR, and that for each um, A in the interval, when I plug in A into the first coordinate, uh, the resulting map on I to the N minus one has bounded derivatives. So. The next show, that we can assume that F is CR and that uh, when I, I take an uh, for each A in I, so when I take F and I plug in it A in the first coordinate, and I consider it as a function on i to the n minus one, that has bounded derivatives. So this is what we want to show we can reduce to. Um, okay, so for this, I apply this uniform version uh, here to f. Um, For this, we apply the uniform version of um, 2n minus 1 to the family S, where I just view it as a family of functions in, in the second bunch of variables. Um, so we get we get finitely many of these parameterizing families, phi j. Um, as above on intervals and, and, and or and uh, and a partition ij of i, but then I can um, split those up into the finite many intervals and reparameterize each of those intervals and assume that each ij is just i. Um, so partitioning and rescaling we can assume each ij is i. And then I'll drop the J's from the notation. 
So then I fix one phi. Um, and I can assume that the basic cell is i to the n minus one, because if it isn't, I can finish by induction. And then I put g equal to g of x1 up to xn is f x1 phi of x1 up to xn. And then, um, so this phi uh, is, is such that this map then has bounded derivatives uh, when I fix the first one. So right, that's what that's what this does to me. This this parameterization up here. So then, for each a in i, we have. G having bounded derivatives up to order R. Um, uh, sorry, G A. Uh, okay, but I don't know it's C R on on the whole I to the M. Uh, so I apply smooth Sally composition. Uh, so there's a definable Z in I to the N uh, of dimension less than N. Such that G restricted to the complement of Z is CR. Um, using, so then I've got this Z, but that has small dimension. I use uh, 1m for m less than n to find a cellular R parameterization uh, phi z of z. Um, now, since the dimension of z is less than n, um, if I've got one of these parameterizing maps in here, its domain is basic cell, and it has to have some zero coordinates. Um, so since dim said it's less than n, if phi in phi z has domain c, uh, And C has a zero coordinate. And we can apply uh, two, two, and minus one to each G of phi for each phi. So that reparameterizes f on z, and then we have to worry about the complement of z. Um, so we're left with we're left with g restricted to i to the n minus z. Uh, well, then I can apply. So this is a set in i to the n, and I can parameterize sets in i to the n inductively. So we can parameterize that. Um, so we can find a cellular R parameterization uh, psi of i to the n minus z. Um, and now we want to look at the G of size for psi in big psi. So fix 
sine big psi. So its domain is a basic cell. Uh, and I can assume it's height in n. Well, then g, right, psi goes to the part where g is cr. So then g of psi is cr. And if I need to compute its derivatives, um, uh, so, and if alpha is a multi index, uh, right? So, what I'm trying to reduce to the case that I can assume that the um, for each a, when I plug in a into the first coordinate, the derivatives for the rest are bounded. So, now I can take alpha to be in n to the n minus one. Um, with order less than r, and I take a point in the interval, we have to check d alpha of g of psi evaluated it with a plugged in evaluated at some points here. We have to see how this behaves. Uh, what do I get? I get um, so psi is a cellular map. So psi one only depends on the first coordinate. So psi one only depends on A. It doesn't depend on any of the stuff over here. Um, so that means we get this. Um, uh, So what this means is I'm differentiating this composition um, where I plug this into here, but this is just a number now. Um, okay, so this is since psi is cellular. Um, and that, well, uh, we already know that when I plug things into the first coordinate of G, the derivatives are bounded. Um, uh, so this is this is less than a constant. Um, why is that? It's since G B dot, the derivatives here are less than or equal to one for each B, in particular for this B, and the derivatives of these are less than or equal to one because they're part of a cellular R polarization. Um, so and psi r is less than or equal to one. So then you're going to, when you compute this derivative here, you'll just get some constant only depending on n and r. Um, so then by linear substitution, we can make this constant one. Uh, we can assume g of psi a dot less than or equal to one for each a in i. Okay, so that's our second reduction. And now I'll just call like I'll, I'll I'll change the name of G of psi to F. Okay, so so replacing F with each with G of psi for each psi. We may assume the F is CR and 
that when I plug in something for the first variable, the derivatives of the rest are okay for each a in i to the n minus one. So that's what we wanted to assume. <laughs> okay, and then we need a lemma. So I'm going to state the lemma, and then I'll prove it. Uh, I'll use it, and then I'll prove it later because it's a it's a different kind of thing. But this is really where. So this this whole proof, like I said, is due to Binyamin and Novikov, and and this is really the key lemma for this proof, I think. Um, so what's it say? I have a definable function on i to the n and c1 and suppose that um, df by dxj of x is less than or equal to one for each x in i to the n and j from two up to n. So the derivatives with respect to the x2 up to xn are all bounded. Okay, then the conclusion is that the set of a, such that when you plug in a in the first coordinate and differentiate with respect to the first coordinate, what you get is unbounded, that sets fine, right? Um, Okay, so then the set of A in I such that DF by DX1 of A dot is unbounded. This sets finite. Right? So we're going to use that lemma um, so the proof proof of later uh, so I'm going to go back to my proof of parameterization. so I'm in this situation here. Um, now we can order end to the n first by degree and then lexicographically within degree. Um, and we want to show that, um, or we want to reparameterize to get that the derivatives of f uh, up to order r are less than or equal to one. So we can take alpha to be the least index, which that's not true. Um, so let alpha in n to the n be least in this ordering such that its derivatives are big. Uh, well, if there's no such alpha, we're finished. We can suppose that there is. Um, and then we'll reparameterize f uh, to bound this derivative of such that the next, the resulting function has increased alpha. And then we continue inductively. Uh, we parameterize f to bound the alpha f. Uh, and well, we parameterize f and show that the parameterized version show that we can increase alpha. Um, and then we can finish by induction. Okay. So we've got this alpha here with this unbounded derivative. Well, sorry, derivative is bigger than one. Uh, so 
uh, first note that, so this alpha is a multi-index in n to the n, uh, its first coordinate has to be at least one uh, because we've got all the derivatives uh, of the other um, derivatives just res with respect to alpha two up to alpha, sorry, derivatives just with respect to x two up to xn are already okay. Um, so, uh, um, now by this lemma here, Um, there are only finitely many k in i such that the alpha of f of a is unbounded. On i to the n minus one. Um, so for each of those a's, we've got a copy of i to the n minus one, and we can use uh, two n minus one to do that. So we can handle two n minus one uh, to handle these. And then we can assume that for each A, this, this thing here is bounded. Okay, um, so we let S be this step. I take all the X's in the box, such that the derivative, the alpha derivative at F is at least half of the sum of what I get when I fix, um, fix the first coordinate to be the x1 of this. So x1 here is the first coordinate of this x and vary the other things. So this here is bounded uh, by our assumption here. So this supremum exists. Um, and then for each yeah, <laughs> so so I can take this set here. Now by definable choice, I can take a curve, it's a definable gamma from I to S with gamma one, the first coordinate of gamma just being the identity. Now I use this gamma and I put it into the alpha of alpha, alpha uh, well, I'll write it. Um, consider the map T maps to gamma of T, the alpha prime F of gamma of T, where alpha prime is alpha one minus one alpha two up to alpha n. So alpha prime is the derivative that when you differentiate with respect to x1, you get the alpha. Um, okay, so this map here, that's a map on the interval, so I can reparameterize it. Um, so by two, one, we get a cellular R parameterization phi of this map.
Um, now, let's take one of the, the thighs in there. And, and consider this. Consider g of x1 up to xn. It's going to be f where I put phi of x1 and then x2 up to Now this makes sense. Phi is a part of the cellular R parameterization of a map on the unit interval. So all the things in big phi, they map the unit interval to itself. So this makes sense. Uh, now let's compute, well, let's look at the computation of the derivatives of, of G. Um, so I remember being told you should never differentiate in public. Um, and this, this lecture completely breaks that. <laughs> Except I'm not really doing it. I'm just telling you, computing the beta less than alpha, we get d beta of g. That's going to be less than some constant, depending on n and r. Um, so the one we need to worry about is the alpha one, as you'd expect. Uh, so when we compute the alpha of G, well, what do we get? We'll get a bunch of stuff where we're differentiating F to some order other than alpha, uh, but smaller, um, and that's going to be okay. But there's there's the, the problem case is when we differentiate we have the alpha derivative of f and then a bunch of phi's coming out. So when we compute the alpha g, we get we get some number of terms. Um they're all bounded by C N R plus a term coming from D alpha of f. So D alpha f. Uh, evaluated at phi, sorry, phi of x1, x2 up to xn times when I get this one, I'm going to uh, have the derivative of this to the power alpha 1. Uh, I don't need those points yet. Um, so if we can control this, then we're okay. Now, uh, by our definition of S, I'll go back to it in a minute, and gamma, we have, so uh, this, this thing here, the absolute value of this, Um, so gamma picks out points in this set here. So when I plug gamma in, I get something that's at least half the supremum. Um, so that means that this bit here is less than or equal to two times um, the derivative evaluated at phi of gamma. Uh, so we get less than or equal to, the, the first bit stays times the derivative evaluated at phi of gamma. Uh, no, gamma of phi, <laughs> sorry. Um, because phi of gamma doesn't make sense. Uh, so you, the point is that gamma of phi of x1 starts with a phi of x1, and then by the definition of s, when I plug in the gamma, I get something that's um, at least half the supremum. So 
in particular, it's at least half of the value here. Um, so we should get a two there. At the front. Can I get mods? Um, and then this one here, uh, so phi is part of a cellular reparameterization. So its derivatives are less than or equal to one. And alpha one is at least one. So this is less than or equal to phi prime. Um, so we need to handle this. Uh, okay, so to bound this, we compute. So I'm going to take d alpha prime uh, of f. So remember that alpha prime is the one where I have to differentiate it with respect to x1 to get alpha. Uh, so I consider that evaluated at gamma of phi of x1. And I differentiate this composition with respect to x1. Okay, so now I'm definitely differentiating public. <laughs> so what do we get? We get a phi prime uh, times d alpha f evaluated at gamma of phi of x1. And this would be times gamma one prime, but gamma one is the identity, so we don't have that. Um, plus, phi prime of x1 times the sum from j is 2 up to n, where I differentiate the jth coordinate of gamma um, with respect to its variable. I evaluate that at phi of x1. I multiply that by uh, the derivative of this in the jth coordinate. So alpha j I to f value to the gamma of phi of t. Okay, uh, ah, and alpha j is um, is alpha prime plus the unit in the j coordinate. Okay, so this here, this is what we want. We want to control this. And, and this, this formula is going to give it to us. So why? So phi is a cellular reparameterization of um, d alpha prime, right? Uh, right, this was the map that I reparameterized here. Phi is a cellular reparameterization of this map. So that means when I plug in phi's, the derivatives are bounded. Um, so this is bounded since um, phi is, uh, since big phi is a cellular R parameterization of uh, the alpha prime F of gamma. Um, These are all bounded since big phi is also a cellular R parameterization of gamma. So here bounded means bounded by one. Um, big phi is a cellular R parameterization of gamma. Uh, These are bounded for the same reason, because it's a cellular R parameterization. And this is bounded because this alpha j is less than alpha, and alpha was the least one where the derivative was bigger than one.
Um, hence, uh, wait, uh, this is bounded. Hence, this thing here is bounded. Um, okay, so, so conclusion. Uh, so phi prime x1 d alpha f gamma of phi of x1 less than some constant depending on nr. And then I can use linear substitution. Uh, we finished the proof. Uh, okay, so that's the proof of cellular R parameterization following uh, Benjamini and Novikov. Modulo the lemma that I had about derivatives. So that's what I'll prove next. Um, okay, so, so for that lemma, we need a, another lemma. So you have to prove lemma on derivatives. Um, for this, we need another lemma. So suppose I have f. A family of functions parameterized by m uh, going from the unit interval to itself. Uh, a definable family of C1 functions. So then there's a constant such that for all A in M and b greater than zero, if I consider this set, this is an open subset of the interval, so it's a finite union of intervals, and the length of those intervals sums to less than, so, sums to less than c divided by b. So here, this measure is just sum of lengths of intervals. Okay, so this we can prove. Okay, so if I look at this, the sets, The sets where the derivative is bigger than b and where it's less than minus b. Right, they're both finite unions of open intervals. And the number of intervals by minimality is bounded independently by m. Um, Finite units of intervals um, with the number of intervals uh, bounded uniformly in A and B. Um, now, if I take one of those intervals, it has to have length less than one over B. Because if it didn't, then f could no longer map to the unit interval. Um, so each of these intervals has length less than one over b uh, as 
f maps i to i. And so that's if if you don't see that, you can do it as an exercise using mean value theorem. Uh, but then the result follows, right? Because the constant can be the the number of intervals in these two sets. Um, okay, so then using this, we want to prove the lemma that we have before. So I, I hopefully I've copied that so it's going to appear magically. Yes. So we want to prove this. Um, so we have a, a a function from i to the n to i defined in C1, uh, the derivatives with respect to the second up to nth variable are all bounded. Claim is the set of i such that the derivative with respect to the first variable when I plug in a is unbounded is finite. Proof, well, if it's not, it contains an interval. So this set's definable. So, um, if not, this set contains an interval. And we can assume that interval is i. So we can assume uh, df by dx1 at a dot is unbounded uh, for all a. Um, and then by by choice and monotonicity, uh, smooth monotonicity, and replacing the interval again, um, I can get a curve witnessing this. So what do I mean? A family of curves. So by choice, uh, smooth monotonicity, we get, or we can assume that we get, um, a C1 gamma, Uh, so it's a family parameterized by zero infinity of functions from i to i, uh, oops, i to n minus one, um, such that for all uh, b bigger than zero and t in i, so d f by d x1 at t gamma b of t uh, is big, it's bigger than b. So because, because this derivative is unbounded for each i, I can find this, this family of curves. Um, and it's definable. Uh, so then I apply the lemma just now about the, the size of these intervals to each of the coordinates of gamma and to the function f of t of gamma b of t, the family of functions rather. So, um, applying the previous lemma uh, to the coordinates um, of gamma b and to, so that's one family and to a family f t gamma b of t. Uh, there is a constant c such that outside a set of measure at most c divided by b we have the derivatives of these are all bounded by b over three and then i need something extra for this one so d by dt of f t gamma b of t that's bounded by um b 
p over three and the max of the derivatives of the coordinates of uh, gamma b never less than b over three n. And now we'll show that this can't happen. Um, so why is that? Well, so outside this set, so this this measure, I mean, just length of sum of length of intervals. So outside this set, that is where we have these bounds, we have what? Uh, so I, I've got, uh, I compute this. What do we get? We get um, df by dx1. Uh, plus the sum from two to n of df by dx j um, at t gamma b t times the derivative of the uh, j minus one coordinate gamma. Um, so we have this. Now this is supposed to be less than b over three, right? And these are all, well, these are all less than b over three n. These are all less than one, and there's a bunch of them. So this is less than or equal to b over three. But this is at least b. Um, so as soon as this, this set of small measure isn't everything, we have a contradiction. So that means once B is bigger than C, there's something outside, there's, there's something in the set where we have this, and then we get a contradiction. Uh, so this is a contradiction. For B bigger than C. And um, so that means the set we started with doesn't really contain an interval, so it's fine. Okay, uh, right, so that's the end of the proof of reparameterization. Um, so that's all quite technical. The next bit is also technical, but it's a bit different. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so if you didn't like that bit, maybe the next bit is a bit more to your taste. Uh, so, so remember when I talked about the Peter Walkie theorem on Friday, there were these two ingredients. There was the, the parameterization, which we've now proved, and there's the diaphantine part, and that's what we're going to do next. Um, the diaphantine part. And for this, I'm gonna, so I'm not gonna prove what I stated last time. I'm gonna prove something better. Um, so I'm not, that, that doesn't, follow from the proof in Peter Wilkie. So I'm going to instead use um, an argument following Habegger, uh, who in turn was motivated by, uh, by a different proof that Wilkie gave. Uh, okay, so, so Habegger's paper is called, I think it's called Diophantine Approximation. on definable sets. And it, in it, he proves the version of Peter Wilkie where um, instead of considering rational points lying on the set, you consider rational points lying near the set. Um, now I'm not gonna do that, but using some of the ideas from that proof, we can go straight to a proof of um, Peter Wilkie where instead of rational points, we look at points of bounded degree. So that's what I'm going to take from this proof. Um, okay, so so I'm going to sketch. This will be sketchy. Um, uh, now, to count points of algebraic points, 
we need a height for the outer eight points. So, so that's what I'll talk about first. So suppose Q is in Q bar, and let P um, be the unique irreducible polynomial uh, with co-prime coefficients, uh, well, with P of Q zero having co-prime coefficients and leading coefficient positive. Um, then we define the height of Q to be the following. So I take A0 and then I take all the roots of P, uh, I take the maximum of those, the, the absolute values of those are one. So here, Z in C, P of Z is zero. And then I take all of this and I raise it to the power one over the degree of P. Um, so if you, if you haven't seen this before, this might not help much. But I'm going to tell you some properties of the height. It has some nice properties. Um, but if, if you don't like it, you can always just assume that Q is in Q instead. Um, but let's do that example. So what happens if I take Q equal to A over B? Well, then P is, uh, is uh, what? B X minus A. <laughs> um, so the height of Q is, is B times the max of one and 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 uh, a over b so it's it's the max of a and b which is what we defined before right so this height extends the height we had before and it has it has nice properties So e.g., uh, the set of Q in Q bar such that the height of Q is less than or equal to some bound and the degree of Q is less than or equal to some other bound. This is finite. So if you bound the height and the degree, you only get finite many numbers. So loads of proofs in, in Diophantine geometry Loads of finiteness proofs. You, you, what you do is you bound the height and you bound the degree and you conclude finiteness. Um, and so, because it's finite, it makes sense to try and bound the number of points of bounded degree and bounded height lying on a definable set. Um, what else does it satisfy? It satisfies. It's, it behaves well with respect to addition and multiplication. So polynomials. Um, so things like uh, the height of one over Q is the same as the height of Q. Um, if you have a non-zero algebraic number, its height is one, if and only if it's the root of one. Um, yeah, so these things aren't obvious from this definition. There's an alternative definition coming from embedding Q alpha um, into different periodic fields, but I'm not going to use that. Uh, well, I'm not going to. I'm going to use it, but I'm not going to give that proof. Um, I don't want to go into that side of it. Instead, I'll just give some references. So, for reference references, so there's a book by Bombieri and Gubler called Heights in Diophantine geometry. And there's a book by Massa called uh, Auxiliary Polynomials in Number Theory. Uh, which has an unusual density of jokes from Asperg. <laughs> Thank you.
Okay. Um, so what are we going to do? So given x uh, e and h at least one, we put. So previously we had this uh, x q h, and now we have x e h. Uh, this is going to be the points on x intersect q bar such that that point has height less than or equal to h and uh, degree over q at max t. Uh, uh, I'm supposed to stop at 10 to. I'm going to write a proposition very quickly. So this is what we're going to prove. Proposition. So this should have OK. OK, suppose k and e uh, at least 1, k less than n. Uh, uh, d is a, uh, at least e plus 1 times n. Are these all integers or integers? Then there is a C with the following. Oh, and an epsilon, sorry. There, are, there exist C epsilon with the following property. Um, suppose phi uh, sorry there exists c and epsilon and r so these are reals r is an integer with the following property suppose phi is a parameterizing map uh, In, into the k alpha less than or equal to r and put x to be its image, uh, then for h at least one, the set x e h is contained in the union of at most uh, C H to the epsilon algebraic hypersurfaces of degree at most D. Moreover, epsilon tends to zero as D tends to infinity. Okay, so what does this say? <laughs> so it's a bit quick. It's just like we had last time, except now. And um, I've got points of degree at most e rather than just rational points. So what it says is, um, if I'm looking at the image of a parameterizing map, then I know that there, um, the points we're interested in are contained in some small number of hypersurfaces. Um, and so next time, I'll sketch the proof of this. I'm not going to prove it in full detail um, because that would take too long. Um, and also, I mean, there's no moment about it. Um, but <laughs> but I will, I'll, I'll sort of sketch parts of the proof. Uh, and then hopefully next time, or perhaps the time after, we'll finish the proof of Peter Wilkie. OK. Thank you, Galas. Stop the recording.